Psalms 87, verse number 1, the Bible says, His foundation is in the holy mountains. The Lord loveth the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of thee, O city of God, Selah. I will make mention of Rahab and Babylon to them that know me. Behold, Philistia and Tyre with Ethiopia, this man was born there. And of Zion it shall be said, this and that man was born in her. And the highest himself shall establish her. The Lord shall count when he writeth up the people that this man was born there, Selah. As well the singers as the players on instruments shall be there. All my springs are in thee. Look back at verse number 1, and there is a telling little thought between the Psalm 87 and verse number 1. Do you see in your Bible where it says, a psalm or a song for the sons of what? Korah. Circle that phrase, the sons of Korah, because that is the title and it is the background of this psalm. The sons of Korah were that line and lineage of the priests, the Levites, that would ultimately be tasked with being the doorkeepers in the house of God. Do you remember in the psalm, whenever the psalmist says, I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in all of the tents of wickedness. He was writing that to this certain group of men called the sons of Korah. Now the sons of Korah were those people that had been tasked every single day to open the house of God for business and they were ultimately tasked with closing the doors to the house of God at the end of business. And this is what he writes to them. He says, men, he says, there is a group of people in verse number four and five that take pride and take homage and they take glory in the fact that they can say, I am from Babylon. I am from Tyre. I am from Philistia. They would look at those big cities of Babylon and they would look at the big cities of Tyre and Philistia and they would puff up their chest and they would say, I dwell in the big city. I am from the mighty Babylonian empire. I have got big things in my background because I am a Philistine. And he looks at the doorkeepers and he says this. He says, this is what you get to take pride in. You you get to take pride in saying that you are a citizen of the city of God. He said those people over there, they take pride in the fact that they say, I'm from Babylon or I'm from Philistia or I'm from Tyre. He said, but oh, sons of Korah, you may just be a doorkeeper in the house of God. He said, but throw your shoulders back, big boy, and look up to the heaven of heavens and take pride in the fact that you are are a citizen of the city of God. I remind you tonight, brothers and sisters, we may not be the richest people in the world. We may not be the smartest people in the world. We may not have the biggest of anything in the world. We may not have the nicest cars. We may not have the biggest homes. We may not have the biggest portfolios. You and I may not have the most education, but every day that we live, we get to throw our shoulders back and lift our head up to heaven and say, I am thankful and glad that I can say I'm a citizen of the city of an everlasting God. And tonight, I may not be able to say I'm a card-carrying member of the Republican Party or the Democrat Party. I may never be invited to give the big political speech, but I can say with all the pride that God will give me in my heart that I am glad to be a part of the church of Jesus Christ in this day and this hour that we live in. You say, what makes you so happy to be a part of the church of Jesus Christ?
price. Well, you got to think about the sons of Korah. These sons of Korah, they never touched the blood. They never got to go into the holy place. They never got to light the menorah. They never got to touch the showbread table. They never got to hold the loaves in their hand. All they got to do was to open up the door and let people go in and close the door as people tried to get out. They were the ones that turned the key. They didn't have blood on their hands. They didn't smell like the sweet incense, but you know what they were able to say? They were able to say, I may not have that in there, but I'm just as valuable out here because I'm a citizen of God's kingdom. And tonight, I'm telling you, do not get in your head, beloved brother or sister, that you are not important because you're not the preacher, because you're not the singer, because you're not a deacon. At the end of the day, if you are saved by the grace of Jesus Christ and you got the Lamb's blood on your heart and heaven is your home, you are a part of the family of God and you and I are valuable and the ground is level at the foot of the cross and we all matter in the kingdom of God. This ain't the Lions Club. You know, if this was the Lions Club, the man at the top would matter the most. This ain't the YMCA. If it was the YMCA, the CEO would matter the most. This ain't even the Elks Lodge. Y'all don't even have Elks Lodges up here in Tennessee. Y'all don't even know what Elks Lodges are. Well, I don't know what they are either. I've just seen one or two of them. But if we had that, whoever was at the top would be who's important. Brothers and sisters in this place, in this house, it doesn't matter how much talent you've got. It doesn't matter how much money you've got. It doesn't matter whether you work out there. It doesn't matter whether you sit in here. It doesn't matter whether you preach right here. It doesn't matter whether you sing right there. The women that work in the nursery and the men that are out in the parking lot and the ones that work security and the ones that tithe and the deacons that serve and the preachers that preach and the singers that testify, we all matter in the kingdom of God and we can take pride in the fact that at the end end of the day, whether you're a brand new deacon or a 90 year old deacon, you matter in the kingdom of God. Whether you're a widow or whether you are a brand new married couple, you are a member of the kingdom of God. And tonight I am glad to say I'm a part of the church of Jesus Christ. What makes a church so special? I give you four things, probably only going to get to three. I'm probably only going to get happy about two, which means I'm only going to give you one. Number one, Number one, you say, what is so special about the church of Jesus Christ? In verse number one, the first thing that is most special about the church is what we're built on. Watch what he says in verse one. His foundation is in his holy mountain. He said what that city is founded on is deeper than the mountain. It doesn't say the foundation is on the holy mountain. It says the foundation is in the whole. It goes deeper than the rock. It goes deeper than the mountain. You see that city was built on something that when the walls started shaking and when the earth started rattling and when the world started turning, that city would stand because of what it's built on. Brother Brothers and sisters, I remind you tonight what the church of Jesus Christ is built on. What we're going to ask that brother to stand for in just a little bit. What we give preachers the charge to preach. It's not the word of man because when the world shakes, the word of man, it will fall by the wayside. But our foundation is founded on the chief cornerstone, which is Jesus the Christ, the son of the living God. And when the world shakes and the foundations are destroyed, he still stands. Stands. He's beneath the mountain. He's beyond the mountain. He's above the mountain. He's below the mountain. He is the mountain. He is the one that we are found. Fa- and tonight, it's not on Tyler's word. It's not on the Baptist word. It's not on the denomination's word. It's not on the council's word. It is on the word of the living God. And at the end of the day, the foundation we stand on is Jesus Christ and him alone. I'm glad I'm a part of a church that still believes in Jesus Christ. What we're built on is what sets us apart. Brothers and sisters, we are not built and do not change based on who is at the top and who is at the bottom. Tonight, we are all saved upon the doctrine of the foundation of the blood of Jesus Christ. Every rich, every poor, every white, every black, 
every person. And I'm glad I can say that my foundation is what I built. Number two, the second thing that I'm glad I can say I'm a part of the church, not just because of what I've built on, but number two, but because of what I'm held behind. Watch what he says in verse 2. The Lord loveth the gates of Zion. Now my little boy asked me this, my little girl rather, the other day. She said, Daddy, in the Bible, when it says Zion, what's it talking about? When you see Zion in the Old Testament, it is a reference to the fortress system of Jerusalem. It's a reference to the fighting towers in Jerusalem. It was the fortress structure. It's what protected them from attack. Watch what he says. He says, I love the gates of the city of protection, Zion. The gates. What's a gate? What's a gate? It's a door. What's a gate? It's a door. What's a gate? It's a door. What's a gate? Okay. What's the purpose of a door? It lets you get in when you want to get in, and it keeps people out that you want to keep out. Brothers and sisters, how many of you know that the one most important thing in your house, besides your air conditioner, say amen right there, the one most important thing in your house is the structure and security of your door. You can have a strong foundation, but it won't keep you safe if your door don't stay locked. You say, I don't believe in that. You just help yourself, booger bear. We'll see how you look in this time next week. You say, what's so special about a door? When you want to get in, it lets you in. But what you want to keep out, it keeps those things out. I'm thinking about something. And my mind ain't really thinking as clear as it ought to be thinking right now. But I'm thinking that somewhere in the New Testament, there is somebody that declares themselves to be the door. And I remember right that it was the loving Lamb of God as he looks at the sheep and he makes this statement. He says, I am the chief shepherd. I am the good shepherd. I am the door of the sheep. And if any man will come in, he shall find pasture and no man the thief can't break through and kill the thief can't break through and steal I got to looking that up one time I was over in the Holy Land and we went to this sheep pen and they come over and whenever you're the leader of the group they always want you to come up and touch all the sheep and hold all the goats I ain't holding no nasty goat I didn't hold an American goat I sure enough ain't holding no Nazareth goat (laughs) they don't bathe them over here you know they don't bathe them over there now my little wife, she's got a, Eric, we got a picture of her holding this, this, uh, this sheep on the side. She said, come here and get a picture. I said, no. <laughs> Nasty, holding that thing. So we go into what's called the Nazareth Village, and they've got a recreation of the sheepfold in Bible days and how they would build a sheepfold. You know how they would build a sheepfold out in the field? If they didn't have a cave around, what they would do is they would take sticks and twigs and they would interlock them and they would tangle them together and they would build a a circular half moon that would go around and they would put the sheep on the inside. One time, one of the first times I went over there with Brother Ralph, I looked at him and I said, can I ask you a question? I said, would you tell me what good is a half moon sheep pen? Because they ain't nothing keeping that sheep from getting out and they ain't nothing from keeping that coyote from getting in. It ain't got a door. The little man with that staff, he said, oh, that's easy. He said, what would happen out in the sheep field is they would build that half moon and it would go all the way around and it would have an opening. And every night when the sun would go down, that shepherd would lay himself down in that doorway and he would become the door to the sheep. And that way, when the sheep were on the inside, in order to get out, they had to go through him. And if the coyotes on the outside wanted to get to the sheep, they had to go through him. That's what Jesus was referring to when he said, I am the door of the sheep. Ladies and gentlemen, 
gentlemen, tonight I remind you of one truth and one truth only. I'm not kept by my power. I'm not settled in heaven because I'm a good person. You say, can you lose your salvation? You can't lose what you didn't earn. It was not given to me because of who I am. It was given to me because of who Jesus is. And tonight I'm safe in the fold of God, sealed and signed because of Jesus Christ. I can't get out and the devil can't get in. I'm glad I'm a part of the church of Jesus Christ. You know, if we were Catholic tonight, you and I would have our fingers plumb down to the nubs, worried did we have enough in the good scale to outweigh the bad scale. Tonight, brothers and sisters, we don't give forth good works to earn it. We give forth good works because we have it. We don't labor and love Christ and live for Christ so that we keep salvation. We live and labor and walk in the things of God because we have salvation. I'm thankful for what I'm held behind. Number three, he says in verse number three, he says, I'm thankful to be in the city of God because of what we get to boast of. What we're built on, what we're held behind. Number three, what we boast of. Watch what he says in verse number three. Glorious things are spoken of thee, O city of God. Now I thought he said in verse number four and five, he said those people from Babylon and Philistia and Tyre, they scorned the city of God. Do you know why they scorned the city of God? Because they were on the outside looking in. But in verse number three, there's a group of people that were on the inside looking out. And what they saw on the inside made them real happy. Brothers and sisters, tonight, when I was on the outside looking in, you people were crazy. Everything about the church was crazy. You're telling me that you gave up two times on a Sunday and you went and sat and listened to a man stutter and stammer and spit and sputter and then they would pass around these metal plates and you gave your hard-earned money in that metal plate and then they would get up and sing these songs and some guy would get up and try to get you to sing louder than him. I thought, man, y'all y'all crazy. And then y'all go and you'd sit in these little tiny rooms and you'd have these little flannel graph boards and you'd try to teach somebody. I I thought, man, them people are crazy. And then you got them out there giving out bulletins and paper. I'd sit there and say, boy, you sure are wasting a whole lot of money. I was on the outside and I was looking in and then I'd see all these people that were coming. I'm going to tell you something. Church people look weird to me. You go to Cracker Barrel, church people acted weird. They looked weird. They smelt weird. They talked weird. They just, they dealt with each other. They were always just, they were always, uh, you know, my, my kind of people, we would fuss and we, you know, we do all that. But those people, they were happy and they were all this stuff. And yet I I was on the outside looking in, but at 16 years old at the back of the Vandalia Baptist Church, the Holy Ghost of God arrested my heart three rows from the back. I got gloriously born again by the grace of Jesus Christ. And that day, I no longer was on the outside looking in. I got on the inside and now on the inside. I say, wait a second. These people aren't really that weird. In fact, they're a little bit normal. In fact, I'm starting to think them people out there are the ones that ain't got half a hairbrain for a trigger. You and I know what I'm saying. Here's what I'm getting at. When you're on the outside looking in, there's not a whole lot to rejoice about. But when you get on the inside looking out, you start saying, wait a second. It is good to know that when you die, you're going to heaven. It is good to know that you've got peace in your heart. It is good to know that what you're singing about really resonates on the inside. It is good to know that I can give my kids something that really matters. It is good to know that I know at the end of the day, whether I come or go, I'm headed to heaven. That is glorious to talk about and sing about. But I got one more. Can I go to number four? I've been rushing through this whole thing. Just get to number four. I want you to go to the very last verse of this chapter. I want you to see something. Watch what it says in verse number seven. Watch what it says. As well the singers as the players on instruments shall be there. Watch this phrase. All my springs are in thee. I got to thinking, what in the world does that have to do with anything? Thank God the singers are there. Oh yeah, all my springs are there too. Either the Lord has got ADHD like I do and it's just all over the place 
or the two were connected. Here's what would happen. In Jerusalem, there was one main spring. It was called the Gihon. The Gihon was down. I've been down to where it bubbles out from underneath Jerusalem's footsteps. I've been down there. I've watched it bubbled out from the, the pool of Bethesda. As you go down through the tunnels, I've seen it bubble out. There was this spring, and here's what that spring would do. It would feed everybody inside of Jerusalem. When you got inside the city walls, if you were thirsty, you could get a drink from the fountain. If you hadn't had a drink in a while, you could get a drink. Now, here's what would happen. Those, I'm going somewhere. I'll stay with me now. Here's what would happen. You would be on a journey. People lived all over Israel. They lived in, and they lived in the Galilee. They lived down south in the desert and they would come from miles and miles around three different times a year. And when they left their house, they had a whole lot of water. But by the time they got to Jerusalem, when they got to Jerusalem, they were thirsty. Their water had run out. They were parched. They were weary. They didn't know if they could make it. They didn't know if they had enough strength to get to the next day. But here's what would happen. They would crest either down through the southern Kidron Valley and they would make their way up. And as soon as they come up out of that valley, they would see that glorious temple shining in the golden glory and they would start hearing the songs. They would start hearing the singing. And when they heard the singing, do you know what they knew? They knew we're close to water. They started hearing the, they started hearing the, the trumpets blasting. And you know what they thought? Boy, I'm about to get me some refreshment for my part soul. They would hear the music and the the Levite choir singing and they'd say, oh boy, I sure am close to the city of God. And when I get there, I'm going to get bubbling that water on the inside of me. Brothers and sisters, I remind you right now, the people of God, we don't just sing just to sing and take up a certain time in the service. We don't just rejoice just to take up a certain time in the service. There are people in this room watching online, coming on Sunday, coming on Wednesday, teenagers, kids, and all over the place. They come in from a world and they're weary and they're tired and they're broken and they don't know how they're going to make it. Some of them come from broken homes. Some of these women don't even know how they're going to make ends meet and they don't know what to do and they don't know where to go and they don't know how to operate. They had water when they left on their spiritual journey, but as they come into the house of God, they've got no joy. They've got no peace. They've got no help and all of a sudden, they pull onto this ground and that spiritual music, it starts playing in their soul and you know what they realize? Oh my, I hear the bubbling brook one more time. Maybe I'll find a little joy in my heart. That's why they came this morning from the lowest parts of Indiana. That's why they came this morning from Alabama. That's why they came this morning from the, 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 the sides of Mississippi. You know why? Their souls are weary and they're tired of going to dry barren deserts, but they found a place where the bubbling brook of heaven will flow again and they come into this place and they come in weary and they walk out wonderful. They come in tired and they go out refreshed. They come in dry and they go out and they say, I'm glad that I found a place where the springs of heaven are flowing again. That's why we sing. That's why we preach. That's why we have church. People are weary. I'm glad I can go to church and not leave drier, but more full. You ever come into church dry? Oh man, son, I came into church dry this morning. Buddy, I'm going to tell you something. I was weary. I was tired. I got up here and I told Troy when I got done, I said, son, I felt like I was taking that tractor up one hill and up another hill, pulling rocks behind me. I got, in the, got into the, the thing after it was over. And I sat in there and I said, what in the world? And man, I, I, listen, you know it's a bad Sunday when I go hide. When I get done and I go hide, it's bad, okay? It's bad. Either there's crazy people around and I'm running from them or it's a bad Sunday, okay? I got in there and I sat there. I thought, I ain't talking to no. Don't y'all act like y'all ain't never left a church and said, boy, that was terrible. Boy, I sat in that office, Ray, and I thought maybe everybody's gone. Maybe everybody's gone. Looked out the window and there's people in the parking lot. And I thought, would these yammering yappers just stop and leave? <laughs> so I finally walked out. I get out there and there's this family out there. And I'm thinking, oh Lord, I got to apologize for how bad that message was. 
I got to apologize. Terry, you're kind. That was terrible. I, I said, I got to apologize. Oh, Lord, I got to apologize. I walk over to him just ready to apologize. And I walked to her. I said, folks, I said, I sure am glad y'all came. She said, Pastor. She said, you'll never know how much that service meant to me. I said, well, I sure am glad that you received a blessing. <laughs> I went in that office this afternoon. We had the deacon council. And I could tell when I pulled on the property, the bubbling brook was going to be swelling. And tonight, I came in a little dry, but I'm feeling mighty refreshed right about now. And brothers and sisters, I may not be anything special. This may not be the greatest this, and it may not be the highest that. But may we walk in a way and live our lives in such a way and have a church in such a way and have deacons and pastors and staff in such a way. We may not agree on everything. We may not like everything that everybody... I don't even like everything that I do and I live with myself. But here's what I'm telling you. Let us live in such a way that when people pull onto the property and they hear the name Hillcrest, they say, wait a second, I, I hear the sweet music of heaven bubbling again and they say, I'm going to get refreshed. I'm going to get joy. I'm going to get peace again. Let the joy of God start bubbling when people come to the house of God. I love the 